On this episode of the Get Out and Drive podcast, we're going to talk to a guest that has been on Roadworthy Rescues, American Pickers, and Lost in Transmission. Stick around to find out who it is. And find out how you can win another Racing Junk t-shirt. We're going to have some listener shout outs. And find out what John learned on a new segment of Trade School. You're listening to the Get Out and Drive podcast with John Custom Car Nerd Meyer and Jason Old Car Guy Car. We'll be bringing you gearheads everything you never wanted to know about cars and why they should be on the road and not in your garage. Are you ready to get out and drive? I'm John Custom Car Nerd Meyer. And I'm Jason Old Car Guy Car. I can't believe we just got through that. And Jason, you know, it's been everybody's dream to have a an old car dealership or have a car dealership in the in the height of activity in an old town that's been my dream for quite some time and i know either having a car dealership or having an old chevrolet or ford or amc dealership or anything in a small town is incredible uh just to get the the feel of what it was like to be in that small town america today we can actually talk about it with someone living the dream well today on the show we have robbie collier from Collier Motors AMC. Welcome to the show, Robbie. Well, thank you, John. I appreciate it. Uh, and you too, Jason. Uh, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is my first podcast. So, Robbie, I stumbled upon your dealership or the family dealership through a uh-huh. YouTube video that was uh, yeah. put out about a year ago. And that's when I reached out to you back probably late last summer okay. uh, to see if we could kind of start this ball rolling. Something at some point led to where you are today yeah. obviously with your father's passing right. uh you've got this dealership it's full of cars you've got the building you've got a service center not to get into any you know family detail right. specifically but how did you overcome the passing of your father to take on this responsibility of all these cars i sort of got weaned away from cars sort of out of necessity and a large part people don't wonder why the cars you know have gotten to where they are and, and all and that that's a good question a very good question Part of it has to do with several stories of family illness that sort of drew our attention towards the family instead of at the business and and and, and the place would decline. You know, you know, selling cars is okay, but it would be nice to work in a place with a benefit. So I actually got a job with UPS, and it would provide for my my family and all. My dad was determined not to have another employee uh, after like 1992. He didn't want to go through the m- monthly and uh, all this stuff. So you know, you limit your capabilities but he still was able to you know survive and and uh, do and sell cars he sold plenty of cars he and my dad was getting up into his 80s and uh, he was still working on cars until he had a heart attack uh he was 85 some of these cars that we still have were sort of auction mistakes at times if you've heard the mickey gilly song all the girls look prettier at closing time well my brothers overdubbed that song and all the cars look prettier at auction time and uh, some of these cars, you know, I would make a mistake, you know, buying them and uh, not not meaning to, but maybe not doing my homework as good. And Chevy Corsica in particular, I wish I'd never seen it. Each car has its own story here. Some are more glamorous than others. Uh, we've had uh, some rare cars here. Uh, we had Nash Healy's, which is very rare. They only made 506 of those. I, I helped my dad. That was his dream car. And I helped him uh, buy our first one. And then we found two in Hollywood. and. Uh, the American Pickers guys, Mike Wolf and Frank Fritz, came and bought those two cars from us. Um, and we had another, I found another parts car because the first one we bought was not complete. But we've had uh, a hydrogen powered Gremlin. That was UCLA, a project when they were experimenting with hydrogen powered cars or alternate fuels. That was their entry. That came out of Harris Museum in Arizona, Harris Casino. And when they were closing it, I found out about it and uh, we bought that car. And it was it was customized by George Barris of Barris Customs, and we kept it here for a while. But you know you can't drive a hydrogen powered car, and so I decided to go ahead and sell it. But we took pictures. You look on post on Facebook, you can see my dad standing out front of our business with the sign and that hydrogen powered Gremlin there. And uh, that car is in the Don Garlitz Museum now. I think he has it in storage right now, so it's not on display. But it was on display a month or two ago there, and it's been there for a few years. You know, so that was a that's a rare car. Um, had several AMC convertibles, uh, including the Nash Healy's. Two, two of those are convertibles. But um, we weren't exclusively interested in AMC, although that was our love. Um, we've had some of everything here from Porsches to 
260, 280Zs. We had uh, Triumph Stags and Triumph Spitfires and MGA. And uh, we had some kit cars. Uh, <laughs> had a Sebring kit car, which is the Austin Healy replica, but it had a Ford V8 drivetrain. It only had 45 miles on it from being had a Rolls Royce replica here. So, Robbie, uh, in the heyday, what was generally the heyday of of Collier Motors? Kind of give us a time frame of when it started ish to when it when it ended, and and uh, and what was the main reason that it had officially ended? Nash and Hudson merged to become American Motors in 1954. They continued to sell Hudsons and Nashes, and he was doing pretty good uh, when he when he had his grand opening. He sort of chuckled about this. He had flowers ordered and streamers for the showroom and the showroom window. The plate glass was not in, installed yet. The guy that was sweeping up in there said, so told to the other one, he said, uh, this showroom is so small, he's not going to be able to fit but two cars in there. And he won't be able to sell but one of those. <laughs> and my dad overheard that. He was in his office over there and he overheard it. And he was determined to make a good go of it and up until around 1957 or so. Then they got new leadership and um, decided to call everything a rambler. So my dad's company went from Nash, uh, Collier Nash Motor to Collier Rambler Motors, and he did. He he made he was very good with cars and good with people, uh, like the Wilson uh, Police Department bought a lot of cars from us. Uh, even though he was just mainly the the main salesman, and he did a lot of the mechanic work, he was out selling some New England dealerships that had service managers and parts managers and all this stuff. He was out selling them. In fact, he won a trip. Have the car sold itself, and he you could. Here in his uh, recounting these things, he he had a sales pitch about how the, the springs were tuned to your heart and different things like that. He he uh, he was a good salesman, but um, so it uh, we we outgrew the little build, building downtown because we were having to pull the cars out during the day and pull them back in at night, and we had an overflow lot. and In seventy two or three, he bought a a big um, school complex, a campus of a a trade school, and he spent the time to rehab that to make a big showroom and then a six bay garage in the back. It's the big, it's about a five acre property, which gave us a lot more room. Well, the, the prime interest rate for the best borrowers went up to 22% around 1980, just after Carter got out. And it was just fluctuating so bad and nobody was selling cars. You, Daddy said you could go out in front of our property on the highway and lay down out there almost because there was no cars coming. You know, our local Chevrolet dealership went, went out of business, but American Motors dealerships went from about 2,600 down to about 1,500 in those years. That was just a good time to get out. But, but that's 1980 might have marked the last new car, but we'll concentrate on the AMCs from, from 1980. Um, um, when I moved back here in 1990, uh, then we were a, a full, full on um, collecting AMCs, selling AMCs, um, and other cars. Uh, it was uh, also marked when we started buying that were collectible. That was, uh, we had a 70 AMX four speed car in our showroom from 1980 till uh, 2015. It was in our showroom up there. At one time, we had one of each year of the two seater AMXs up there. We had a convertible or two. We had other cars inside. And, you know, we're not Jay Leno, so we can't put everything under one roof. So, you know, cars did suffer outside, but, you know, we never saw an AMC for sale that we didn't like. So, and we would sell a lot of them. We we sold plenty of them, but um, but they concentrated on used cars and did collect AMC cars and would buy and sell uh, interesting cars. I'd say ninety to ninety nine was a heyday for buying and selling rare AMCs. Uh, these cars here, when you buy a car at Collier Motors, my dad would tell people, you know, it's a used car. It comes with an Alabama guarantee. If it breaks in two, you get both pieces. I wish. Uh, John, it's time to announce one of the winners of our Racing Junk t-shirt giveaway. We've asked to hear about the furthest road trip you've taken recently on our Lister Hotline. And we have our winner. Hey, Jason and John. Get out and drive. Uh, Steve Ferris from Central New Brunswick. Um, Now, hold on. Did Jason pick the winner? Steve is from Canada. Is this thing rigged? Steve, ignore John. Please continue. Our longest trip in 2022 was the last weekend of July. When my wife and I piled in our Mazda 6 2013 with 272 horsepower V6, and we booted down for Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, driving along the south shore of Nova Scotia. It's 400 miles one way. We had an awesome seafood meal at Rudder Seafood Restaurant. 
and uh, near the Cat Ferry Terminal. Takes a big catamaran from Yarmouth to Maine. Um, we went to the Cape for Shoe Lighthouse and uh, saw some great sights, hit some local eateries, and uh, had some awesome food while we were there. Just a terrific trip all the way around. We came back home through the Annapolis Valley of Nova Scotia. So we went across the southern part of Nova Scotia on the way down. And we went to the Annapolis Valley, which is the northern part of Nova Scotia, on the way home. It was great. And we saw a lot of great sights along the way. See, it's not rigged. Just a cool story. Steve, if you're listening, be sure to shoot us a message with your address to info at getoutanddrive.com. And we'll get a Racing Junk t-shirt and some other swag right out to you. Jason, let's give away another t-shirt. Okay, let's do this. Our partners at Racing Junk are giving away a Borowski engine. You know, that big, powerful LS that was on display at SEMA. The question is, how much is that engine worth? Well, there's an easy way to find out. Just race over to racingjunk.com, go to the giveaway section, and you'll find the information there. And once you know what that Borowski engine is worth, go over to getoutanddrive.com and scroll all the way down to the bottom of the homepage and give us your answer in our listener hotline. And don't forget to enter the win the Borowski Racing Engine on racingjunk.com. We know you enjoy the Get Out and Drive podcast. John, let our listeners know how they can support the show. Well, you can buy the show a gallon of gas. Uh, please explain. You've heard of buy me a coffee, right? Oh, yeah. But who needs coffee? We need a gallon of gas. Just go to our website, getoutanddrive.com, scroll to the bottom of any screen, and you'll see the buy us a gallon of gas link. Just click, and you'll help to keep our show running. So, Robbie, when you guys were running as a dealership, especially as an AMC dealership, you must have had to have a lot of different uh, materials like, um, you know, shop manuals, repair manuals, all that sort of thing there. So as it's, you know, things are kind of deteriorated, the business has closed down, but yet the building, the lot is still there. Do you still have all of these repair manuals? Are they still available? Like, do you still have them in stock? Well, um, we did have some of those. Um, he uh, was sort of choosy about what he would put in in the parts room. Um, he did buy out a dealer or two every every once in a while. We had some new signs that are not here anymore. But um, I did sell a a big. There's a double set of uh, parts books uh, recently to a car club guy in uh, Tennessee. They're they're having the AMC National next year in in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. The cars were made in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, and they always have every four years or so, they have a big homecoming there. So we went, attended both those meetings. I took some good interviews. I'm Wally Booth, who was a NHRA champion in a Gremlin and a Hornet. And uh, uh, Tony Pinto, who started this company called American Performance, his daddy, uh, he's a NASA engineer, but they have, you know, sell parts down in Florida. And, um, you know, even some of my friends, Josh Greenplate has bought uh, Kennedy American. That's another big parts supplier. Um, I got to meet and talk to all these guys and, and actually recorded a guy named Gordy Chilson. I've got a, you know about 45 minutes with him. Uh, you learn a lot about American Motors. Even I met some uh, engineers uh, with AMC and, and other people. So, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to continue to do that. A couple of acquaintances of mine are doing this uh, big AMC documentary it's a six issue video documentary on the history of american motors um and they're working on that they've they've done most of their interviews and it, it they're doing a gofundme thing to sort of support it but it tells from start to finish the story of american motors really enjoyed meeting people at the at big uh amo meets too and we're planning to attend the that big national amo in in knoxville coming up um this year so you can become a amo uh American Motors Owners Association club member for like $25. Sort of a small network of uh, support for AMC parts. Uh, there's a, place, a couple of places in o Ohio and then Florida. And then there's some other the, uh, Facebook clubs. There's uh, I sent I shared a bunch with a lot of Facebook clubs of some of this media attention that we've been getting. Right. Robbie, it's, it sounds like to me that there's two sides to Collier Motors. And one of them is the history of uh -huh. what your family has made that business to be over the years and then there's the more current or the more modern history that's being built being able to tell all these stories 
through shows like uh you know motor trend plus everybody that's been there to visit you over the years and i think that us being able to talk tonight and get a lot of viewers out there and a lot of listeners who are interested in the history of rebel and to hear that you know what there's still one remaining dealership out there on this planet uh that still bears the name amc believe it or not you know these videos that have come out one of them that uh, mitchell stapleton video within a month he was very popular within a month it went over a million views and now it's up to 1.7 million i think but uh you hear people contact me you know just different things that we've we've let go from here now but uh yeah, Robbie, it was Mitch's video that I saw that okay. uh, prompted me to reach out to you. And again, even back then, I think that movie was or that video was out over a year ago. Uh, you had a, a full lot full of vehicles. We had a, a few TV people come over the years. Uh, in fact, Top Gear had wanted to come. We had signed the releases for them to come, the three guys. But I was working at 50 and 60 hours a week at UPS, and they wanted me to get three cars roadworthy to drive to charlotte and i you know i tried to see if i could do it but i just couldn't do it and uh, so that time went by but rutledge wood did come a, a show called uh, lost in transmission and um and then of course american pickers they came that that's uh we saw mike wolf uh back in july uh we went to see him he was uh if you if people want to meet mike because he's a very big car nut and a motorcycle nut he, he's fixing to sell a 70 some of his uh prized motorcycles but um every third saturday in columbia tennessee where is near where he lives he has a car show in the morning early morning at seven seven o'clock to ten o'clock you can go meet him it's, uh there's usually about a hundred cars show up he bought an old uh, 38 chevrolet dealership there and he's re renovated it to uh, look like an old is they call it gasoline alley and he was really nice frank and my dad and Mike out with a Nash Healy that Mike bought. We had is that Healy? Is that Healy the one that had the Cadillac engine in it? Yeah. Um, that car was it was it has an interesting story. There were two Nash Healy coupes that I bought from a, a girl in Hollywood. Her dad, Gene Ashman, if you remember the the monkeys on TV, was their head costumer. He came up with about five thousand costumes for that series, the monkeys. He was actually the president of the union of costumers in Hollywood, and he liked cars and he liked these Nashes. And he had this uh, one of the Nashes uh, hot rodded in Eddie Myers Speed Shop in Hollywood, California. He was Eddie Myers is sort of like Vic Edelbrock out there, but at his speed shop, he would uh, shoehorn Cadillac engines into cars too. Um, and Donald Healy originally was coming to America to find uh, Cadillac engines to put in his sports car, so it sort of was uh, you know sort of appropriate for somebody to put a Cadillac engine in that car, and they also louvered the hood, I guess, for the V8 engine. It was getting hotter under there, so they did a really good job of louvering it. But yeah, we've had people come, and most recently, um, Derek Berry from uh, Vice Grip Garage, because he took a, a old Rebel and he bought it from Roadkill. It was a mid-engine Rebel. They had put a V8 engine <laughs> right beside the driver's seat, and he drove it home, and he said it was like being in front of a fire with somebody spitting oil at you because <laughs> this mid engine the V8 engine was in the engine, I mean, the passenger department, but he was so popular on YouTube that Motor Trend offered him a show called Roadworthy Rescues. Mm -hmm. And they approached us actually uh, within a week, he, uh, he gets a car running and obviously actually gets it roadworthy. And so my, the best story was a rebel convertible came on the lot, a 67 rebel convertible red, um, V8, and it wasn't quite ready to put on the road. It needed a top, needed some interior work and a little bit of door work. My dad tucked it away. He he sort of winterized it and tucked it back in this tin building. And then we put a 64 Mustang in there, then I put a Marlin in there. And then my mom, she was trying to start an antique store. She bought put a bunch of antiques in there. And and 43 years passed by. My brother never got to drive his first car. It was a very good story. So the network actually agreed to let us keep the car. They usually buy the cars, but they agreed to let us keep it and do the story here. So they came, they started sending parts. Uh, it was like a kid in a candy store sending parts ahead of time. Said, Sean, the first box come here. He said, well, in, in a week or two, you're going to be swimming in boxes. Usually it's a 10-week wait. You get a convertible top cut. I talked to somebody 
in New York and they cut me one in like three days, uh, cutting some carpet sets, uh, just everything. People just pitched in, uh, just pitched into the calls and uh, and made that show work really good. Well, uh, they said, win or lose, rain or shine, Friday afternoon at six o'clock, we're leaving town. <laughs> and uh, then they wanted Douglas to drive it. Nobody had driven it yet. So Douglas drove it around our property. So that's in that it's a 45 minute program on uh, Motor Trend Plus that you can see the whole story since it was his story. I want to give a quick shout out to one of our listeners, Scott Schmaltz. Scott posted on our Facebook page. He made a run to Michigan to pick up a door for what we call in Canada, a grooming. And he said, I had you guys on for the long drive. Thanks for keeping me awake. Scott, thanks for listening while you get out and drive. Don't forget to tag us in the pics of the Grumman you're building. So Good current night. so current day, um, yeah. I know you've kind of brought us through the history of Collier Motors. Current day, what is happening today? And then well, future, what is, what's going to, what's, what's well, the future for it? Well, we're, we're looking hopefully within the next two years to uh, find as many homes for the cars as we can. I, it's not the Shangri-La that people always used to think it was maybe, but my wife and I have um, managing, uh, we've sold several cars in the, you know, uh, probably 50 car, fifty or 60 cars. So there's now down to about 250 maybe or so. It's, at one time, the five acres were pretty much full. You know, we're down to, we sold most of the first string. We're down to the second string. And then there's some third strings out here that, uh, I mean, you, where can you go in this world right now and see this many old cars uh, unmolested? We, we didn't run a salvage yard. We were selling cars. And so these cars are not, 99% of them have not been parted out in their whole car. So, but, you know, it's not all Maseratis or anything there. Let's assume for a second that every car is now sold at Collier Motors. What happens now? We're strictly a, an estate here and a trust that's um, dealing with the disposal of the cars and selling them. We have to deal with the building. Hopefully, I'd like to sell the building as is. Um, still has a good garage in the back, but, you know, uh, it's good commercial property. They built a food line grocery store across the street from us, and there's an auto zone right out of our front gate. And uh, so it's a good location for commercial property. So hope we can end the place with honor there. And Robbie, I'm so glad that we had a chance to talk and get some of these stories because oh, yeah. you made our job so much easier. We just had to sit back and listen to you tonight. Uh, but one last question uh, sure. very quickly. If there's one piece of advice that you had to give a young person today who's interested in getting into the automotive industry or the business or the trades, what have you, what would that piece of advice be? Hmm. Sell something that you love. And we we loved AMC, so it wasn't hard for us to sell them. It was uh, it wasn't work to to go out and find them and sell something that you love, and it won't be work to you. It'll be an enjoyment. And uh, that's what it was. My, my dad worked very hard. I mean, many nights he was working till nine o'clock at night. But so uh, it was just a pleasure to be around cars with him. Uh, unfortunately, my my kids didn't have the same uh, benefit. Uh, I was drawn away with UPS and and I, we we put them through Christian school. So I, uh, my kids, it was more of a place where a lot of mosquitoes were and a lot of a lot of briars and stuff. So they didn't get the the pleasure that we had i really hate that yeah if our listeners yep and our listeners our viewers how they can find you and uh, and the best way to contact you we're still we're still selling even though the business is closed i'm having people uh come by appointment uh our my contact information is on facebook with call your motors amc okay uh these are our own tags we're call your motors amc and pikeville you can google it um i sell these tags for like shipped for 26 25 99 or something like that if you if you make a visit here you you get them you know 20 bucks or something but i've sent those tags uh fixing to send some to australia uh they've gone to belgium sweden um canada all over the place um i'm glad you were in a good mood tonight so we okay, can yeah. uh, we can hang yeah. out with you and, and and make you laugh and get the really really good <laughs> fun uh history on collier motors anytime uh if people want to visit call ahead uh don't just show up i had people show up from michigan just unannounced and they bought a javelin from me but they were just lucky to find me there uh, the oh. place is closed and i'm we sell stuff out of the estate and it, it takes a while to get the title <laughs> transferable 
from the dealership to the new owner, but that that we take care of that. Uh, it's, we have to pay taxes on it and get them registered again and and all that. So it, it's a little bit of a you can't just show up and unless you just want a parts car, you can show up and leave one today. But it takes a week or two to get it uh, lined up. Whether it's one person coming from wherever or uh, have got a group of ten coming shortly, you're welcome to come and tour the place uh, with with advance notice. Mm -hmm. And I'll be glad to show you around. And I treat one person as just as well as I treat uh, 10, 10 people. Showing well, up. we'll do our best to get some people headed your way. I'm sure yeah. you uh, don't need more, but our listeners and viewers of the uh, Get Out and Drive podcast will certainly uh, learn more about you. Thank yeah. you very much for uh, hanging out with us for a bit and telling us history of Collier Motors. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it very much. It's that time again. Time for Trade Schooled through our What Drives Youth initiative and our partnership with the RPM Foundation, we strive to put an emphasis on the value of attending an automotive trade school and passing down information to the next generation of gearheads. This week on Trade School, John learned something new about MGs. John, what did you learn? Well, I thought all original, like early 50s MGs, we were riding a uh, uh, 1953 MG, uh, an auction for one the other day, and I thought they were all unibody. Really? And I realized that I was wrong. Yes, John was wrong. Uh, they did have a chassis. I don't know if or when they went up to unibody, but for some reason I thought they were all chassis cars. So stick that in your little uh, your little notebook of information. If you're thinking about going out into the automotive trade, the Get Out and Drive podcast wants to encourage you to check out Doug Herbert's Brakes, which stands for be responsible, and keep everyone safe. They offer hands-on driving classes for 15 to 20-year-olds in the controlled environment to learn the ins and outs of handling cars in different situations. So kids and parents of kids, be sure to go to putonthebrakes.org to learn more. Well, that's great information, Jason. If you want to work on cars, you need to have as much experience as possible driving and handling all types of cars, even stick shifts, in a variety of situations. This is just one in a long line of skills that can't be taught in the classroom. And that's all for Trade Schooled for this episode. Like I always say, the best way to gain knowledge and information is to learn with your mouth shut. Cruise on over to our website, getoutanddrive.com, for all the info you never wanted to know about our podcast. Hit us up on our listener hotline, be the first to know what's happening, get industry news, and grab your Get Out and Drive merch. Connect with us on social media. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. Follow us on Twitter at Get Out and Drive Pod. What drives you? Welcome to another episode of the Get Out and Drive Podcast, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and I am Jason Robbie Collier Collier. Every intro it takes us 10 takes. Go like this. <laughs> bobblehead. Get out and drive right. bobbleheads. Yes. We actually did it. I'm so tired. <laughs>